Good morning, I'm Methodist Church of Wellsboro. Welcome to our Sunday worship this day. Today we're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 4, verses 13 through 21. This is the New Revised Standard Version. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his, uh, his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in, in the love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and though and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. And those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. And then as, uh, for the whole sermon series, we've been looking at this passage from Mark 12, verses 30 through 31. I just want to remind us of those today. It says that, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Let us pray. Gracious and holy Lord, may your spirit work in our hearts this day. And may the words that I share and the meditations of all of our hearts be accepting in your sight. We pray this in your name. Amen. Good morning, church. I believe that it's probably safe to say that we have all, at some point in our life, told a little white lie from time to time. Or at the very least, we've kept our feelings from each other, even when there is a misunderstanding between two parties. Deception is, and has always been, a prevalent part of the human experience. Humanity has regularly struggled with how we honor one another and respect one another. We know, too, that our actions are often dictated by where we find our identity. And so, where do we find our identity? For most of us, we find our identity in our faith, our families, our local communities, groups, or organizations, and even our social and political leanings. All of these have inherent value and can give us a glimpse into who we can be and how we can be the best that we can be for each other. These parts of our lives have given us a moral structure for how we look at our neighbor and look out for our neighbor, and they provide us the reason for the decisions that we make every day. The problem, though, is with any one of these components of our lives is that they are human-made and flawed in, in many different ways. They do not have the purity that is needed for a truly righteous and fully faithful way of living. The only thing in human existence that is pure enough is Jesus Christ and his teachings. As I mentioned in previous weeks, this sermon series is focused on getting us back to the basics. The call to follow Jesus and live the Christian life as instructed by him is a call to get back to the basics. Human-made structures like religion and social engagement will always be flawed in one way or another. Just look at human history and we see where the church has failed, where society has faltered, and where humanity has collapsed on its own brokenness. When we rely on human-made institutions to be our guide for truth and justice, it becomes easy for us to be divorced from the grace of Jesus Christ. Humanity has relied on itself to fix the problems that we ourselves create, but we have not always been the best at having an unbiased perspective of the world. There has always been a great need for humanity to have a holistic perspectives 
of life and, and God's will for us. And therefore, it is necessary that we be able to remove ourselves from given situations in order to have clear minds to see what Jesus is doing and the way of Jesus. In the Gospel of Matthew, Christ says that, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. The love that Jesus, that Christ instructed his students in, was one where we would give of ourselves to the other. We do not do acts of charity and love because they are a way to salvation, but rather they are the means of grace that we offer because of the gift of salvation that we have received. We work on our faith in Christ so that when the time comes for us to live for justice and mercy, we will be ready. When I speak about getting back to the basics of Christian life, this is what I'm speaking of. Many churches and church communities have been fearing the lessening influence of the church in a larger society and have called for us to hearken back to the good old days. But we must ask when those were. The Christian religion in the United States, as well as around the world, has been complicit in many of the atrocities that we read about in history books. For many of us, the Holocaust comes to mind, or slavery in the United States, Japanese internment camps, or even opposition to the civil rights in the 1960s. In our culture, what has often been defined as God's will, has been the things that bring us comfort, even if they may not be right. There have been moments and communities throughout history that have embodied the way of Jesus in truly amazing ways, and often they pay the price for that commitment. I've heard it said that Christian communities of the past cannot be held to the count based on our modern understandings of morality. The example that I often hear most is that, that though we believe holding slaves is wrong, we can't hold those Christians to account because that understanding was not a part of their culture at the time. And though this may, be sound reason, may sound reasonable, I also think about the fact that they had the example of Jesus just as much as we do. When speaking about slavery, John Wesley was an ardent supporter of abolishing the practice. He believed that it was the single, singular greatest evil that man could commit. He said of slavery, Give liberty to whom liberty is due, that is, to every child of man, to every partaker of human nature. Let none serve you, but by his own act and deed, by his own voluntary action. Away with all whips, all chains, all compulsion. Be gentle toward all men and see that you invariably do with everyone as you would he should do unto you. This sounds a lot like Christ calling in Matthew 25, our passage from 1 John 4 that we read, as well as our calling to love our neighbor all of which revolves around this understanding of honoring, caring for, and treating our neighbor as we would want to be treated. Christians have not always been the best at living into this calling of loving God and neighbor. We have been unwilling at different times to be honest with ourselves about where we were in our faith. We have not always done our best to put the well-being of our neighbor ahead of our own. And yet, that opportunity is always just around the corner for us. It's always one decision away from becoming the reality that will guide and inform our entire life. So that brings us to what is next. Though many of the more flagrantly dark times in Christian history might be in the past, we still have a responsibility to not just present but live into the 1 John 4 love that we have read. If we, as a church, want to feel the presence of God in and amongst us, then we need to live into the life-changing love of God. For Methodists, we call this the process of sanctification, moving on to Christian perfection in love. 
something that Jim Paxson is going to be sharing with us in a few short weeks. Our first John passage calls us to live into God's love and allow for it to abide in our hearts. We begin this process of abiding with God by asking questions and seeking answers. We need to be open to how God is changing our hearts in the midst of this world. We are expected to listen to one another and hear each other's hearts. By listening to each other, we will be freed from our own perceptions of the other person. Society has been relying on assumptions about who people are and what they are feeling for us to even have a complete comprehension of one another. Too often. Our world relies on stereotypes and fear of the other. This does not allow for the love of Jesus to move freely in our world. God has given us a great gift in Jesus Christ, but we also have the choice and the ability to stifle this gift too. My prayer for our world and society is that we can get back to the real basics. I pray that we are able to see, honor, and respect each other enough to value one another as Jesus has valued us. I do not trust that the world, both Christians and non-Christians, will be able to experience the freeing power of God's love if it is too clouded in judgment and distrust. We need a revival of God's faith that looks to the heart of the individual rather than the labels and preconceived notions that we have made. The church has to has had to struggle through generations of failure to make even the most modest improvements of where our hearts are. I fear that the current climate can do damage that will take generations to repair. As much as we may not like to admit, our culture is slipping backwards into those places where, though our morals might be different from generations past, our hearts are beginning to view each other as threats more than as a possible helpers in the journey of life. Friends, this is where loving our neighbors comes back into play. I entitled this sermon, Love Your Neighbor for the Love of God. We need to love our neighbors for our own self-interest as much as for theirs. Today, let's encourage each other to be beacons of light in the world When we abide in Christ and him in us, we will see the changes immediately in our own personal thinking. We'll be set free of the burdens that the world has placed on us. The stress and anxiety of the other will begin to melt away because we will no longer view them as enemy, but rather as a beautifully created child of God. In time, we will see the transformative power of God working in the world, healing the brokenhearted because we will be changing from the inside as I mentioned last Saturday or last Sunday, we do not know what life will be like after this election. There is no way that we can tell the future, but we need to be preparing ourselves to be the church in that uncertain world. That begins here, with us allowing for Jesus to abide in us and us in Him. Let us allow for Christ's perfect love to cast out fear. Let us love because he first loved us. Let us love everyone so that we are not made out to be liars. And let us pray that God will help us love our brothers and sisters as Christ does. And all God's people say, Amen.